The chairman was a man named Senator Nelson Aldrich from Rhode Island. Aldrich represented the Newport, Rhode Island homes of America's richest banking families. His daughter married John D. Rockefeller, Jr., and together they had five sons. John, Nelson, who would become vice president in 1974, Lawrence, Winthrop, and David, the head of the Council on Foreign Relations and former chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank. As soon as the National Monetary Commission was set up, Senator Aldrich immediately embarked on a two-year tour of Europe, where he consulted at length with the private central bankers in England, France, and Germany. The total cost of his trip alone to the taxpayers was $300,000, an astronomical sum in those days. Shortly after his return, on the evening of November 22, 1910, some of the wealthiest and most powerful men in America boarded Senator Aldrich's private rail car and in the strictest secrecy journeyed to this place, Jekyll Island, off the coast of Georgia. With the group came Paul Warburg. Warburg had been given a $500,000 per year salary to lobby for the passage of a privately owned central bank in America by the investment firm Kuhn Loeb & Company. Warburg's partner in this firm was a man named Jacob Schiff, the grandson of the man who shared the Greenshield house with the Rothschild family in Frankfurt. Schiff, as we'll find out later, was in the process of spending $20 million to finance the overthrow of the Tsar in Russia. These three European banking families, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, and the Schiffs, were interconnected by marriage down through the years, just as their American banking counterparts, the Morgans, Rockefellers, and Aldriches were. Secrecy was so tight that all seven primary participants were cautioned to use only first names to prevent servants from learning their identities. Years later, one participant, Frank Vanderlip, president of National City Bank of New York and a representative of the Rockefeller family, confirmed the Jekyll Island trip in a February 9, 1935 edition of the Saturday Evening Post. I was a secretive Indeed, as furtive as any conspirator, discovery we knew simply must not happen, or else all our time and effort would be wasted. If it were to be exposed that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. The participants came here to figure out how to solve their major problem, how to bring back a privately owned central bank. But there were other problems that needed to be addressed as well. First of all, the market share of the big national banks was shrinking fast. In the first 10 years of the century, the number of U.S. banks had more than doubled to over 20,000. By 1913, only 29% of all banks were national banks, and they held only 57% of all deposits. As Senator Aldrich later admitted in a magazine article. Before passage of this act, the New York bankers could only dominate the reserves of New York. Now, we are able to dominate the bank reserves of the entire country. Therefore, something had to be done to bring these new banks under their control. As John D. Rockefeller put it, quote, competition is sin, close quote. Secondly, the nation's economy was so strong that corporations were starting to finance their expansions out of profits instead of taking out huge loans from large banks. In the first 10 years of the new century, 70% of corporate funding came from profits. In other words, American industry was becoming independent of the money changers, and that trend had to be stopped. All the participants knew that these problems could be hammered out into a workable solution. But perhaps their biggest problem was a public relations problem, the name of the new bank. That discussion took place right here in this room, one of the many conference rooms in this sprawling hotel, today known as the Jekyll Island Club Hotel. Aldrich believed that the word bank should not even appear in the name. 
Warburg wanted to call the legislation the National Reserve Bill or the Federal Reserve Bill. The idea here was to give the impression that the purpose of the new central bank was to stop bank runs, but also to conceal its monopoly character. However, it was Aldrich, the egotistical politician, who insisted it be called the Aldrich Bill. After nine days at Jekyll Island, the group dispersed. The new central bank would be very similar to the old bank of the United States. It would be given a monopoly over U.S. currency and create that money out of nothing. How does the Fed create money out of nothing? It's a four-step process. But first, a word on bonds. Bonds are simply promises to pay or government IOUs. People buy bonds to get a secure rate of interest. At the end of the term of the bond, the government repays the bond plus interest and the bond is destroyed. There are about $3.6 trillion worth of these loans or bonds at present. Now here's the Fed money-making process. Step one, the Federal Open Market Committee approves the purchase of U.S. bonds on the open market. Step two, the bonds are purchased by the Fed from whoever is offering them for sale on the open market. Step three, the Fed pays for the bonds with electronic credits to the seller's bank, which in turn credits the seller's bank account. The trick is that these credits are based on nothing. The Fed just creates them. Step four, the banks use these deposits as reserves. They can loan out over 10 times the amount of their reserves to new borrowers, all at interest. In this way, a Fed purchase of, say, a million dollars worth of bonds gets turned into over $10 million in bank accounts. The Fed, in effect, creates 10% of this totally new money, and the banks create the other 90%. To reduce the amount of money in the economy, the process is just reversed. The Fed sells bonds to the public, and the money flows out of the purchaser's local bank. Loans must be reduced by 10 times the amount of the sale. So, a Fed sale of a million dollars in bonds results in $10 million less money in the economy. So how does this benefit the bankers whose representatives huddled at Jekyll Island? First, it totally misdirected banking reform efforts from proper solutions. Second, it prevented a proper debt-free system of government finance, like Lincoln's greenbacks, from making a comeback. The bond-based system of government finance forced on Lincoln after he created greenbacks was now cast in stone. Third, it delegated to the bankers the right to create 90% of our money supply based on only fractional reserves, which they then loan out at interest. Fourth, it centralized overall control of our nation's money supply in the hands of a few men. Fifth, it established a central bank with a high degree of independence from effective political control. Soon after its creation, the Fed's great contraction in the early 1930s would cause the Great Depression. This independence has been enhanced since then through additional laws. In order to fool the public into thinking the government retained control, the plan called for the Fed to be run by a board of governors appointed by the president and approved by the Senate. But all the bankers had to do was to be sure their men got appointed to the board of governors. That wasn't hard. Bankers have money, and money buys influence over politicians. Once the participants left Jekyll Island, the public relations blitz was on. The big New York banks put together an educational fund of $5 million to finance professors at respected universities to endorse the new bank. Woodrow Wilson at Princeton was one of the first to jump on the bandwagon. But the banker's subterfuge didn't work. The Aldrich bill was quickly identified as the banker's bill, a bill to benefit only what became known as the money trust. As Congressman Lindbergh put it during the congressional debate, the Aldrich plan is the Wall Street plan. It means another panic, if necessary, to intimidate the people. Aldrich, paid by the government to represent the people, proposes a plan for the trusts instead.